We're the biggest air armada that was ever assembled in the history of mankind. Add that to the list of famous phrases that will come back to bite you. Just like forgetting to hit that subscribe button will come back to bite you too. You'll miss out on hearing the low monotonous drone of my voice. This third episode of Masters of the Air falls into two of the traps that I'd said in my previous reviews that I'd hoped the show wouldn't fall into. Shorter episodes and episodes concentrating on planes flying. This episode clocks in at 48 minutes, already down 20 minutes from episode 1. Once you remove the ridiculously long credits and the stupidly long title sequence, you end up with around 40 minutes of actual show. Most of which is shots of planes and people rugged up from head to toe with caps and masks on. So this mission is meant to take out a German ball bearing plant. Thankfully, the commander shows you what a ball bearing is in case you forgot. Then our guys are going to head down to Africa instead of chucking a Yui and heading back over Germany to England. For some unknown reason, Bucky is riding along as a reserve command pilot. At least everyone else on the team is as confused as I am in this regard. This show has a tendency that it refuses to break, of using jargon and not explaining to the viewer what that jargon means. I've noticed a lack of a narrator this episode. The narrator can be useful to explain to people like me what is actually going on and what are the implied ramifications. The commander says that the success of this mission depends on getting the whole gang joined up over the channel. Why do they proceed when everyone else is delayed by the bad weather? I hope we get answers for this. They're really leaning into this buck not liking sports thing as well. If that doesn't pay off, I'm going to be very annoyed. Apparently they say hack to sync their watches, but that's never explained. The commander just says hack and they all look at their wrists. All three of the task forces are socked in? What the hell does that even mean? I assume it's a reference to the windsock. Maybe the fog is so thick they can't see it? While we're waiting, they tell the classic story of the two doors, each with a guard. One leading to heaven, the other leading to hell. One guard tells the truth and the other tells only lies. You get one question to ask either one of the guards and once you open the door, you have to go through. But they never tell each other the answer. The episode ends and the only answer is, I don't know, I was hoping you could tell me. If you want to know the answer, you ask one of them, if I was to ask the other guard which door is the door to heaven, which door would they say? And then you do the opposite. During this delay I'm looking at these crewmen, trying to work out who they are and if I recognise them from any of the previous episodes. Nope. They're all strangers to me. But now they're trying to get us to know these two young looking gunners. I feel like that's going to be the theme of this show. Wow, they're really showing us the special bond that Crewman H and Crewman J have in this episode. Let me guess, they'll die now. Lol, baby face, you got the cutest little baby face. Let me guess, if he dies there's not another who could take his place. Baby face. Who's this gravelly voiced guy? I've never seen him before. Are they getting reinforcements in from the states? So LeMay wants this one specific group to go up and have the others catch up. Is he a known psychopath, or did this show make him up? According to Wikipedia, he was a real guy, but Wikipedia reckons that he was in the lead plane on this mission. The flight segments are only superficially exciting. Lots of noises, explosions, fast camera movements, and driving music. But I find myself not caring, because a lot of the time it's just a roll call. Steve's plane is hit. Count 10 parachutes. Now Barry's plane has been hit. Fighters at 3 o'clock, etc. They finally have some tension when poor old Babyface couldn't get out of his ball turret. I felt sorry for the poor bugger who couldn't get him out, but he had to bail or they were both dead. Hearing Babyface plead for his life was heartbreaking. Now I try to imagine it if it was really happening. Sends shivers down my spine. So now you know why we were shown their conversation earlier. Had to build up the emotional attachment. It would have helped if we'd seen anything of them once they were in the air, but that would be asking too much. Kurt tries to land his plane because his co-pilot has been hit and won't be able to open his own parachute, but he pulls up short on approach to an open field and belly flops in a gout of flame. It was pretty brutal to see him realise this was the end. 
Oh god. We're treated to a weird slow motion section. Croz looks out of the window at the destruction going on around him, and we get to see a falling crew member get shredded by Buck's right propeller. Buck's plane gets hit and there's a disagreement with his co-pilot, who wants to bail as the engine is on fire. I don't know if this is meant to look like a badass move, but Buck basically forces his co-pilot to stay in the burning plane. To me, he comes across as a psychopath. If he had explained that they can manage the fire and have enough fuel, I would understand, but he basically forces him to stay in his seat. I think it's Quinn who couldn't get Babyface out of the ball turret, who we're now following on foot in Belgium. He's handed himself into a family. Uh-huh. Buck needs to lighten the plane to ensure that they have enough fuel to reach Africa, so they're dumping everything that's not nailed down overboard, including the bomb site. They were crapping on in an earlier episode about how important the technological marvel that is the new bombsite was to their precision bombing. I wonder if they were getting trouble for throwing it into the Mediterranean. I'd probably hack into it and disperse it over a wider area. If they want it, they'll have to work for it. I didn't know they could drop the ball turret. Why didn't they drop the ball turret with Babyface in it? I'm happy that they showed us some goats, because now I know we're in Africa. Buck's approach to the runway is again full of jargon. Sharpen the turn. Is that good or bad? Feathering the engine? How does that help? They delay the dropping of the landing gear to increase their range and they make it fairly uneventfully. When Bucky arrives, he's all smiles and jokes, but Buck doesn't see the funny side. They start reeling off names and I've never heard of any of these before. Who even are these guys? Sadly, I must report that due to the lack of interesting characters, the shorter running time and the monotony of the flying sections, I'm lowering the score again. We're now down to a 6 out of 10. I just don't feel myself sucked into the story as much as I feel I should be. This is a subject that's right up my alley, yet the execution is letting me down. Get me some more relatable characters, give them time to interact and show their personalities. And if you're going to spend 30 minutes in planes, maybe just concentrate on the crew of one plane. I felt the obvious presentation of Babyface as the sacrificial lamb this episode was too cheap to really be memorable. Babyface is right up there with Wade from the Obi-Wan Kenobi show. The death of Kurt was a bummer, but only because he was one of the four crewmen I could recognise. He went down in such a ball of fire that there is no way they can claim he escaped. If he returns, I'm done with this show. So we're down to three of the named characters that I can recognise. Cross, Buck and Bucky. Stupid idea to go with those nicknames. Stuff gets changed all the time for TV adaptations. That should have been one thing that was changed. I get it. It mirrors real life. Often there'll be two people with the same first name. Okay, but there's context clues in real life. Who we're looking at. Who's in the room. If one Steve is a chef and you ask Steve to bring something to eat, Mechanic Steve isn't going to turn up with a box of two-minute noodles. The over-reliance on jargon makes it difficult to follow what's happening. A lot of the time you'll find yourself thinking, they all seem happy about that, so I assume it's good. Or they all scowled at that suggestion, so it must be bad. Without ever truly understanding the implication of this news. I feel like this is going to be the theme of these reviews. I can't build a rapport with characters who have their faces and bodies covered for the majority of the show. This is just a fundamental flaw in producing a show based on the topic of World War II bomber pilots. Either you come up with some way to base most of the episodes outside of the actual missions, or you risk the audience never actually caring for your characters. And I don't think Masters of the Air is going to even attempt the former. Unfortunately, I feel that Masters of the Air may be sticking too close to the source material and focusing too much on the missions rather than the men. And I'm going to walk away from this series not caring that it has ended, unlike Band of Brothers. Maybe if you're a massive history buff, with a focus on Air Force in World War II, you'll enjoy this series. Or if you have a grandfather who served during the war and you'd like to get a feeling for what he went through, perhaps this is a series for you. But for the casual viewer, it's becoming harder and harder to recommend. Thanks for watching. If you like what you saw, please consider subscribing. I release reviews occasionally when time allows, and a thumbs up would be a big motivator for further reviews. If you didn't like it, feel free to leave a thumbs down and let me know how I can improve in the comments below. Anyway, I'm Mixie, thanks for your time, and have a good one.